All right, guys. How's everybody doing? Good morning. All right, let's pray and get started. Dear Father, we just come before you, and we just thank you so much for bringing us together. Lord, we thank you for uh, just uh, all the great things that you're doing in our lives and our hearts, and we ask that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may learn and grow in you, Lord. We just thank you for answered prayer. We thank you for, uh, for all the, the great things, Lord, that you're doing, and you are just so faithful to us. Bless this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Sharon, glad you're back. Look at that. Huh?
majestic is a perfect word to describe you, Lord. Thank you so much for being that. You're so wonderful. Father, we just worship you, thank you, and praise you for all the goodness that you have towards us. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're, that you're just so perfect and majestic in every way, shape, and form. We love you, Lord. In your holy name, amen. Amen. If you got a bulletin, open it up. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Long Beach. If you're new today, I'm glad that you're here. Every Sunday morning, we get together, we get into God's Word. Today, we're going to be in continuing through Ephesians chapter 4. We would love to have you open up to Ephesians 25. We'll be in there today. Uh, if you're a kid, and if you would like to get a, a kid packet today, grab one up, or grab one with Kelly up there, and, or in the back. Uh, they have some. You can doodle and have some fun uh, with one of those. Uh, children's ministry is coming. Just pray it in, guys. After church prayer, if you need prayer after service, do not leave this place without getting prayer from one of the elders up front, and they'll just uh, pray for you, and they'll be here for you. Uh, Joyful Life Women's Bible Study is tomorrow night here, 6.30 p.m. Ladies, it was a great time last week, This uh, and we're gonna, it's going to be a good time again, so make sure that you are there for it, ladies. You're going to be in Psalms 96, right? Yeah, 96? Yeah, okay. I uh, just want to make sure that I got that right. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, tomorrow night, ladies. Hope to see you there. Uh, midweek Bible study, Wednesday night here in the main auditorium, 7 o'clock. We'll be in 1 Samuel 3, and you don't want to miss that. Uh, the call of a little guy named Samuel, okay? And it is some good stuff. We'd love to have you out. Don't forget your Bible reading homework this week, 1 Samuel 3, Ephesians 5. Operation Christmas Child, if you did not get a box... Last week, we, we ran out, praise the Lord. We got 30 more back there, but this is it. This is, uh, we, we, they, they cut us off. So, uh, uh, so we're like, man, good grief. Well, that's a good thing. Everybody's passing them out. But uh, pick up your boxes today. Don't forget them. Uh, and then, of course, bring them back, of course, on November 14th. Don't bring them back early. Why, you can't. But not, uh, just don't do it. Just don't do it. We don't have the space. <laughs> Hold on to it till November 14th and bring it all here, and we'll pray for it, uh, and that'd be great. Um, after church help today. Now, guys, uh, we have a, a little bit of a problem. We, we need more seats for the women's Bible study. So because of that, uh, we're going to bring, and I hate, the, like, the white chairs are good that we rent from Lakewood Rental. I mean, we love that guy. Mick is a great guy, uh, but, you know... We want you to have a little bit of comfort, ladies. So what we got going, and I need your help today, if you want to help out, I, we need a crew of guys to go all the way over to the other side of the school where our connex is at, our storage shed. And it's so far away. But the cool thing about the storage shed, they, they let us know, you know, Pastor Andrew, could you get rid of the storage shed? And, and I said, sure, sure, I'll, we'll do that, you know, and we are just want to accommodate Long Beach Unified. But then COVID hit, and it stayed. I was like, oh, great, I don't have to deal with it. And then one of the janitors asked if they could use it. So I'm like, even better. Now they have skin in the game. So, but the problem is, uh, we are, the rest of our padded chairs are in the very back of it, okay? So we're going to be, I need some guys to go over there, get, this, get the seats out. Now, they've been in there for a year and a half. So we're going to bring them back over. There's only 15, okay? 15 chairs. We're going to bring them over. We're going to clean them up, okay? So if you want to be a part of the, let's go get them, bring them back. And then if you want to, if you're like, I'm not a grabber, but I'm a cleaner, then stay here. We're going to bring them right here to the, to the stage and clean them up with Windex. And we brought, we brought Windex, right? We forgot the paper towels. We'll get that. We'll get that. Don't worry. Uh, we're, 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 it's, there's so much. So we'll have all that set up. And, uh, um, and just clean up the chairs, and then we'll be done. And remember, many hands make a light job. So uh, we would love to have your help after church for that. Season for marriage, fall season, Saturday, October 23rd, 5.30 at the home of J.R. and Sherry Dalton. I uh, would love to have you sign up today, guys. It's going to be a great time. You don't want to miss it. Always good food. Of course, we're going to be having the main dish of just some smoked meats and tri-tip or whatever. I don't know. It's going to be good, but bring a side dish if your name applies and a dessert if your name applies. We'd love to have you. Friday, November 5th at 6 o'clock, teen movie night at my house. Backyard. It's going to be a lot of junk food and chicken strips, and we're going to watch the birds, and uh, it's always fun. So uh, be there for that. Teens, 
Communion Sunday is going to be uh, November 7th. We'd love to have you out to remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Go Team Evangelism on the northeast corner of Corona and 2nd Street downtown on 2nd. We'd love to have you. We, uh, they witness in front of the Catalyst Pot Shop. Would love to have you. And the Lord has just been doing a great work. Get involved, guys. You don't want to miss out. And the cool thing is the Spirit has led uh, Brad and Olga to, to do it more than one day. They said there needs to be more. So we have increased. They have increased it. We have increased it to November 13th and 14th. All right? So it's, it's going to be a great time. We'd love to have that Saturday and Sunday and at noon down there. We'd love to have you. Come on out. Tracks will be provided. They have them there. They're also going to be passing out Bibles. And uh, you just want to be a part of it. It's going to be a sweet time. We'd love to have you guys down there. And, uh, and it's just a neat time when you just share the love of Jesus and show the love of Jesus. And just say, hey, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And, and just let that be your opening statement. How are you doing today? Would you like this? Hey, can I pray for you? You would be surprised about how many people would say, yeah, I would like to have some prayer, you know? And just being nice. Tell them about, the, about Jesus and the love of Jesus and being honest with them. Come on down, guys. It's going to be great. After church prayer meeting, Sunday, November 14th, 15 minutes after church, we're going to be having the front row prayer meeting, which was so wonderful last time. We're going to have it again. Make plans for that. Abide in Adult Fellowship was great last night. I got reports about how well it went. It was fun. Around 20 people there. It was a blast. We'd love to have you guys come back out on December 12th at Kirk and Cindy's house, and we'll get more details as the time approaches. Uh, if you need prayer, uh, like an emergency prayer request, text me, and we'll put it through to the prayer team. My personal cell phone number is right there in the bulletin. If you ever need me, you got my cell phone. Put it in your phones right now, okay? Just uh, You're like, oh, that's, that's Pastor Andrew, and you have... You don't have to go to the office, and, or our, our mystery office, uh, but at the office number, you can just go straight to, straight to my line, so we'd love to have you. Opportunities to serve are always available. Basketball ministries, if you, if you know anybody who needs a help or a meal during times of sickness or need, we'd love to help out. And of course, don't forget to pick up a Calvary Chapel mission magazine about all that's going on in the Calvary Chapel uh, world and the missions department. It's awesome. But I think that does it for announcements. If the guys that come forward to receive the morning tithes and love offerings, we'll get back to worshiping the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity, opportunity to give to you right now. We ask that you would just be blessed and be glorified by our offerings and our tithes, our love gifts, Lord, that you would use them for the furtherance of the gospel in the city of Long Beach, in this church, and around the globe, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for the wonderful opportunity to give. And we thank you, Lord, also that you give to us. And we just want to thank you for that, Lord. No matter what we give to you, Lord, your grace is going to always be bigger. And we just recognize that. And Father, we ask like we do at this time in our service that you would get a hold of the heart of Long Beach that you would revive your church, that you, Lord, would also uh, get soften the heart of the lost, and that you would do a work in our hearts, Lord, so that we can, so that through us, your spirit may do a work in the hearts of others, Lord. Just do a work. Save souls, Lord. And just uh, let us be a part of your plan. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
Amen. Let's stand up, turn around, say hi to somebody you know or you don't know.
All right. <laughs> if you got a Bible, <clears throat> open it up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Good stuff. Nothing better than to hear you guys fellowship. Love it. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for bringing us together as a family once again. Lord, we never want to squander the fellowship that, uh, we, that we have as a church. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together back into a place with a roof over our head. Uh, Lord, with, with working bathrooms, with, uh, uh, with no demon squirrels running around. And uh, Lord, how, how great you are. Lord, we never want to forget the past and where you brought us, Lord, and how great you are. Father, we pray that you would fill our hearts with your spirit, Lord, as we understand you, Lord, and that you would just cleanse us and wash us, and that we may be pure and holy as we listen to your word. And Lord, and, and even let your word be that cleansing agent in our hearts, the water of the word right now. So bless this time in your holy name. Everyone said, amen. amen, amen. Isn't God's word just rad? It's just so much fun. Ephesians chapter four, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pivot point where we, have, we are moving from where God has us before, where we, God had us in that sitting position. We're, we're in full inheritance. We're sons of God, just, just enjoying Jesus. An inheritance that we have just in Christ. Remember, it just kept on saying, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And now he's moved down to the walking portion. Sit, walk, stand. His Ephesians cut up into three parts. And here he says, he goes, he goes into the, the walk part. The application of, okay, now you're, you're this wonderful, glorious new church pulled out from the world, pulled out from... Jew and Gentile made one in Christ Jesus, a totally new entity called the church. And now you're going to walk. You're going to live it out. And he brings up in chapter four how we need to walk in unity, how we're all one in Christ Jesus. And we have this unity because of him and how we're a new creation. We're, we're totally brand new. We're, we're, we're a, a, something, the church is something new. And of course, in the last part, he talks about us on an individual level. He kind of goes at from the, the macro view to the micro view. Macro, as in the whole church body, then he goes all the way down to us personally. And he says, you guys are the new man, the new woman. And that you should no longer, like it says in verse 17, walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. And then in verse 20, he gets really specific. He goes, but you guys have not so learned Christ. Don't be like the world. When God's called us out of this new life and given us this beautiful thing called being born again, own it, live it. <laughs> I mean, this is what it's all about. And then he gets more specific and he says, put off concerning your former conduct in verse 22. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. He goes, put it off. I mean, it's like taking off a piece of clothing. You know, it's all muddy, dirty, stinky. Put it off. Put off that, that former conduct and be renewed, he says in verse 23. Be renewed, changed, refreshed, revived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, put on. I like that. It's like, it's like you know, when I was a young kid, when I played football, we used to have mud days. And when we would be muddy out in the field, and boy, we, we ran out after school and the whole football team, and we brought extra people, especially the ones that didn't know how to play because we just wail on them. <laughs> and it's fun. And we, got to, we get out there in that mud, that mud. And we were just covered in it. We would come clopping back to the, to the, to the, the showers and we'd just be covered in mud. And then what would we do? We would put off the clothes that were muddy, put them off. And then we would be renewed. We would wash and clean. And then we would put on clean clothes. 
and we would put it on. That's what he's saying here. Spiritually speaking, hey, put off the former conduct. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And in verse 24, put on the new man, which was created according to God, a true righteousness, in, in true righteousness and holiness. This is the character and nature of Jesus Christ. Be like him. And now he's going to get even more specific. This is, I like that phrase, where the rubber meets the road. This is it, man. He's going to get specific. He's going to get down to practicalities, practical stuff. All, almost like bullet points. He just like, boom, 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 boom. This is what the walk looks like. This is how you're going to walk. This is how you're going to do it. When we give our lives to Jesus, the change that occurs, now you know this if you're born again, when you give your life to Jesus, the change that occurs is drastic, amen? I mean, it's just like, wow, okay. I mean, you, you know there's a, been a change, there's a shift, a pivot. Those things that you wanted to do, you can't do. The, God, the Spirit has changed your heart, and, and you're a new man, you're a new woman. And so... When we give our lives to Jesus, the change that occurs is noticeable. We have more love. The Spirit indwells us. It's a really, and Paul is really going to address this, it's really a hardcore rejection of that old former self where we had to really reject it, and we talked about that last week. But then he says, this is how it looks. This is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is practicalities. And he starts going down a, a long list of things. Now, I don't want you to do a couple things. First of all, number one, I don't want you to think this is, this is, oh, here comes that religious list of do's and don'ts. This isn't a list of do's and don'ts. This is a list of do's. This is a list of a new life. This is the new life, the new walk we have in Christ Jesus. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. And if you, want, if you really want to get down to it, Everybody, sinner and saint alike, has a list of do's and don'ts, if you want to get down to it. But this is the thing. It's not a thing of don't do this, don't do this, and by the way, do that. That's not what it is. This is the nature of the walk. This is just what it is. And you can't help it. This is just how it is. And then the other thing I don't, I don't want you guys to do, I don't want you to get all legalistic about it. A lot of people take these, le these lists of, of things that Paul and through the power the spirit encourages the church to do and you get all legal people get all legalistic about it and then they get all you know you know they, they start pointing fingers and they get all oh and they, you know what i'm talking about right spiritual karens you know and they just they just get in there and just go oh, you know and they get mean and they get rigid and they get vicious and they get accusatorially the biblical word is pharisaical and we've got to be careful of that. And, we, and we've covered that in Galatians. Thank God we covered that in Galatians. How we don't do that. And so these are things of love. These are things of grace. I thank God we have these little practical encouragements from Paul through the Spirit. Because you know what? I'll tell you. It's a thing of love. He's telling you this because he loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't tell you. And that's the neat thing. I praise God for this. It's glorious. And so he starts off and he says, Therefore, put in away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, that what is good that he may have something to give him who has need? Paul says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And he'll, they're 30, 32. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, 
even as God and Christ forgave you. Now today, with all that said, you're like, well, are we going to cover the whole thing, Pastor Andrew? Just 25 today. We're going to look at the lovely subject of lying. You're like, oh my goodness. Lying? Lying? I came here to be tickled, not to be tormented. I, I, what, lying? Well, it's pretty big. It's a big thing. We're going to, Paul addresses, the first thing Paul addresses to the Ephesians and that whole surrounding area is the concept of lying. And he says that to us too. He wants the practical, the practical. He, you know, out of all the things that he could have talked about on, on practical, on how to walk in Christ, how to walk in this newness of life, he could have started off with, you know, I don't know, this, that, or the other. But he, he says, we're going to start with lying. You're like, did the Ephesian church have a problem with it? Every church, every person, every human has a problem with lying. Is this what we do? <laughs> it's human. Uh, lying, guys, if you're taking notes today, just, just write it down. Let the spirit minister to your heart. This isn't, listen, it's not my job to convict you. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And, it's like, and so I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to join you. I'm here to be here with you. Because I'll tell you, since, since this morning around 5 o'clock, I've been dealing with lying in my own life. And dealing with little things, little things here and there. and Lying. It hit, hits close to home for all of us. Know this, guys, that lying is the complete opposite of, of Jesus. Actually, the complete opposite of the Godhead. What is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Remember what he says about himself? In John chapter 14, verse 6. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It's in the, in the, the Messiah's very nature. Truth. It's the opposite of him. And it says also in John chapter 1, verse 14, that the Father is full of grace and truth. So the Father is full of truth. It's actually in his very nature. And then, thirdly, it says that the, Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, in describing the Holy Spirit, Jesus in his teaching in John 16, verse 13, says that the, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. So lying goes directly in the face of all three members of the Trinity. It's that the contrast is that clear. The very nature of the Godhead is truth. So anything that is not truthful, anything in our lives, in our own lives, around us, or surrounding us in this culture, that is not truthful is not of God. Period. Someone once said that lies are the speech of the lost world. It's their language. The language of the lost world are lies. It's true. You're like, well, can a sinner tell the truth every so often? They do. But there's a, uh, there's a, there's a vein of lying in every natural man and woman that's apart from Jesus Christ. It's just part of us. When we lie or when others lie, there's two major reasons why we lie. Number one, it's to protect ourselves. It's to protect self. I lie to protect myself. <laughs> True? I've gotten into trouble. Therefore, I'm going to lie to get myself out of it. I lie to protect myself. I told this story before. At my youth, I was in the backyard. Parents were gone. The grass was tall. I decided I'm going to cut the grass with a butcher knife. So I get a big old you know, psycho Norman Bates style butcher knife from the cabinet, start hacking away. I think I'm Indiana Jones going through the forest and I, I slice it through and I'm on my knee. I slice it through and I stick it right into my leg. Pull it out, sucker starts gushing with every heartbeat. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'm like, oh, I'm so, and I, I was more scared about getting in trouble from my parents and I was about the cut. I knew it needed stitches. And I was like, oh, I said, well, you know what? 
they'll be mad that I was cutting grass with a butcher knife in the backyard. So I'm gonna tell them I had a smaller knife and I was cutting a piece of bologna on the couch while watching TV. That makes perfect sense. And I told them that. And when they came home, I said, I cut my phone. They said, how'd you do that? I said, I cut a piece of bologna on the couch and then watching TV. They're like, what? <laughs> you know, and dad goes, oh, okay, all right. Well, let's get you the doctor. We'll sit you up. And years later, I told him the truth. Held on to that sucker. And, and, and my dad, when I told him, he, I was in the office. I said, you know, I did this. He goes, what? <laughs> he goes, what made you think that telling me about a piece of bologna? And, 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 you're an idiot. <laughs> I said, I know. But we, we just lie for the stupidest reasons. To protect ourselves. Get us out of a jam. Number two reason why we lie. Straight up. Not just for protect self, but to promote self. It's to promote self, to make us look better than we, already, than we, than we actually are. And we always do that. We all do that. Every single one of us lie, little things here and there. And both protecting self and promoting self is a result of the root sin of all sins, pride. It's just we, we just love ourselves so much. It's just pride. Pride is that root sin, and we want to protect us because we, we esteem ourselves so much. You know, hey, I'm great the flesh says. And we try to esteem ourselves. You know, Psalms 116, verse 11, one of the, a cool little verse. I just love what it says here. And that first time I was made aware of it is when a girl in my Bible college class was breaking up with someone and she says, this is so Psalm 16, verse 11, 116, verse 11. I said, Psalms 116, verse 11. I said, what is that? And I pulled it up and I read it and this is what it says. All men are liars. <laughs> I was like, man, that's harsh. All men are liars. I said, well, what? You know, why did they put all men and women are liars? I was like, well, that's for another Bible study. But it's the very nature and the very nature of every sinner and saint. To, and we fight it as saints and we own it as sinners, that lying nature. Why is that? Well, listen up. Satan's a liar. And when you don't belong to Jesus, you belong to him. And if you belong to him, he owns you. And if he owns you, you, you hang out with him and you get, his, you get his flavor. You get his characteristics. Tur turn over to John chapter 8. Jesus has a great little lesson on this. In John chapter 8, verse 42, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's in a very heated debate, probably one of the greatest debates he ever had with the Pharisees. Because it's going to end with him declaring himself to be God in front of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. And in uh, chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, or the question is posed, then they said to him, we were not born of fornication, but we have one father, God. He, they were, it was a personal attack that, you know, when you're losing an argument, you just go to the, the personal attack. And that's what they did with Jesus. Jesus was just raking them over the coals with scripture. And the Pharisees just attacked him and says, well, your mother bore you out of wedlock. You're born of fornication. Uh, that's how it is. Uh, and we only have one father. Our father is God, not yours. You're illegitimate, which he wasn't. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but God the Father sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You, and then he gets, per, then Jesus says, you want to get personal? Here's personal. Verse 44. You Pharisees are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. You're a chip off the old block. You're just like Satan. And he says, he was a murderer, and trust me, and Jesus knows Satan. He created him. He was there at the beginning of time with the guy. And he says, he, he, says, he was a murderer 
from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in Satan. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. That means in the Greek it says, that means he speaks for himself. It's him. It's all about him. For he is a liar and the father of it, or the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Wow. Satan is the ultimate liar. He doesn't stand in the truth according to John chapter 8. The truth is not in him. He speaks lies from his own lying heart. It's a personal thing. And I love what he says. He is the father of lies. He's the source of all of it. We know the first lie ever recorded in scripture was performed by Satan in heaven. And what was a lie? He was doing the most common lie of all. Satan was lying to himself. And what was the lie? I can be God. I can be greater than that guy on the throne. And his arrogance, his pride, for the pride was the original sin, first showed itself in a lie he tells to himself. Like all lies that we say to ourselves, it's the easiest one to believe, ain't it? The lies that we say to yourself, you're like, why is that? Because we believe ourselves. Because we think we're the most important people. Pride. And then, of course, he goes to the garden. And when he went to the garden... He sees Eve there by herself in Genesis 3, and he barrages her with lies. He just, he just, he, it's not a light thing. It's a thick layer of lies that he lays on. It's not just a little smattering. It's the whole, the whole package deal that he gives, being the father of lies. He starts off and he says, in his first words that you ever see him speak, Satan, in the scriptures, he says, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? He, his lies start with bringing doubt. He's like, did God really say that? Are you sure about that? Maybe you missed it. Maybe you missed it. Lies. And then the woman, of course, does the stupidest thing in the world here, because we all do it. She does it. She, she's the first one on earth to do it. She answers him back. She talks to him. She engages him. And she says, well, we, and she tries to rationalize it. She tries to, well, let me tell you, let me educate you about what this tree is. And she's wrong. She actually misquotes the Lord. And in verse 4, he says, he just comes out with a bold face lie. You will not surely die. You will not surely die. No, 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 no. That's a 100% lie. You will not surely die. He says, for God knows in the day of you. Oh, I know God. And he did. But he's telling a half-truth here. These are the half-truths. Oh, I know God. He knows that in your day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Those are all half-truths that he said. They were... Sugar-coated lies. They weren't, some of it was true, some of it wasn't. God knows. God knows that, that, that just, it, you know, your eyes will be open. Their eyes would be open, but he doesn't tell them why they would be open or what, how. It was just all lies, half truths. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil, but it, it's just, that's just, eh. He is so good. Satan brings us a cocktail of lies. And they come at us. Now the Bible teaches us very clearly what the result of lying and being a liar is. Psalms chapter 5 verse 6 tells us very clearly that the lying person will see, this, it'll bring about destruction. Lies will cause destruction. There is a clear cut, and there are so many verses having to do with this, a clear cut sign and seeing that lies will bring about and be a part of God's judgment. The result of lying is judgment. God will judge the lying, the liar. It, there is also, with lies comes trouble. There's trouble in River City when there's lies. There's just some trouble. 
and then some bad stuff that will occur. Issues and drama and problems when lies arise. We also know very clearly, he mentions it a couple of times, that lying is an abomination to God. It sickens him. It actually makes him sick. That's what the word abomination means. When something is abominable or an abomination to God. There's a few things that are abominations to God. So often we put at it as, as homosexuality is an abomination to God. That's like the most quoted abomination passage. But there's a ton more of other abominations. And one of them is lying. It makes him sick. You're like, why? Why does it make him sick? Lying and the liar, just, it just, just, the, the process of lying, when we do it, when the world does it, because it goes so against his very nature. It's, it, you know, the number one thing on the list that God hates the most, we know what it is, is pride. It's, it's pride because that was Satan's original sin. It seeks to be God uh, and not the true God. You probably put yourself as God. And then from that comes the lies. And then that affects the truthfulness of God. The truthfulness of God. And it just, it, it just gets, it's too close to home with the Lord. And it's an abomination. There's also, we know, an exclusion that occurs when we lie, when people lie. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in Galatians chapter 5, in those long lists of things, and it says at the end, you know, from fornicators, drunkards, liars, backbiters, you, this long list of things, these long lists of sins and vices that are not part of God's plan and goes against God's character and nature. And what, it, what, it's, what, what does it say about those lists? Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're excluded from his kingdom. You have no part with him. And it's part of that. You, you're not part of the inheritance. And then lastly, it says in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 9, also Revelation 21, verse 8, that the result of lying is always death. It's just death. Remember the story in Acts chapter 5 of that couple? I mean, the church is just kicking. Jesus is ascended up into heaven. They waited 10 days, and the Spirit of God came down upon them in that upper room. Those saints that were up there ran out proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thousands of people get saved the first day of church. And then, the, and then a, a whole bunch, another couple thousand get saved the second day of church. It's growing, multiplying daily. Just great things are going. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They're praying together. They're fellowshipping together. Oh, it's, it's what church should always be that way. It's, it's the normal Christian living. And then there it is. And they're just having a great time. And then some of these guys got a, just a... a just a, a heart full of love. And they just said, and out of love, they said, you know what? We just want to give of our stuff unto the Lord. So they sold their possessions. They sold their land. They sold their houses and just says, we are just going to sell out for Jesus. And they gave it to the church. And the church gave it to the people. And they just, it just happened. It was just a love thing. Not socialism, just love. And so at, when that happens, a, a couple in the church named Ananias and Sapphira, they get together and they said, hey, we want to be a part of that. And so they sold a portion of their property for a certain amount, but withheld some and kept some. And then, told, and then gave them a lower amount to the church, but said it was for full amounts. And it, you're like, well, that's not bad. I don't, so what? That's, come on. That's not, you know. Well, he didn't, God did not want a drop of lying in the church back in the day. And so when that happened, Peter was there and Ananias was brought in and says, Ananias, did you sell this property for such and such? He goes, yeah. And then Peter says, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to us, you've lied to God. And then God strikes Ananias dead right in church. And then they carry him out to bury him. And then his wife comes in, Sapphira, and says, and asks the same question. He goes, why have you done this, Sapphira? The same men who buried your husband out back are here for you now. And she dies. Like, that's a little too much. 
what, what if that happened nowadays? We're all singing it. Remember the old hymn, I surrender all. Eh, eh, eh. <laughs> Liars! You know, I surrender all. Uh, uh, you know, and just croak right there. Oh, that'd be horrible. Man, you're like, I'm glad we're not in the book of Acts. No, that's what it, it was. One of those things that he, he it was the, it was the, how can I say it? He did it in the book of Acts because the, the church was in, the, is, was in its infancy. It was in the cradle and a snake crawled into the cradle. And he was like, oh, we got to deal with it. We got to let him grow a little bit, get more mature. And he was protecting them. Those are the results of lying. Know this, guys, that lies are always a form of hate. It's hate speech. It's devoid of love. Love and truth are always together. Remember, they're Siamese twins. And when you don't tell the truth, when we don't tell the truth, the truth is gone and it cannot be matched with love. So it's devoid of love. Lies and lying are going against the very heart of who God is and against his heart. Now, we, you know, I know, we excuse lying so often. We excuse it so often. There's actually a show called Pretty Little Liars. There's nothing pretty about it. There's nothing little about it. We have the f- common phrase, oh, it's just a little white lie, right? Well, I, I, we've all used that. <laughs> oh, it's just a white lie. It's just a little white lie. You know, when you say it's a little white lie, you're saying it's not that important. It's this tiny, and it's white. That means it's clean. It's not a bad one. It's just cleaned up, and it won't hurt anybody. Little white lies, or LWLs, have the potential to open the door and turn into MDLs, massive dark lies. And we got to watch out. Or we actually, when we lie, we, we kind of boast about it, right? You know, I'm a good liar. I'm really good. I'm good at it. You know, usually it's over a game of cards or something like that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm a good liar. I looked it up, a couple of surveys online, what the most common lies are. Oh, get ready to just feel bad about yourself. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. I'm stuck in traffic. You look great. This is for the, the people who uh, are, are drinkers, the drunks. And we'll get to that later, guys. I'm not drunk. Oh, my phone died. Uh, it, there was, I had no way to contact you. I'm so sorry. I never got the message. I'll call you back. Oh, it cost me this much. It was on sale. Oh, I'm on my way. This is what I've always wanted. You've lost weight. You haven't changed a bit. I didn't do it. I have no idea where it is. You know, I'll try to make it. You know, I just got a headache. I got a headache. I, you know, I would never lie to you. <laughs> I am such and such years old. My age. And this is a Christian one. I'll pray for you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I was going through that list, ooh, I felt like I had to take a shower. I was like, oh, I've done every one of them. Oh, have you? No, you haven't. You're a perfect church at Calvary Chapel Long Beach. That's not you guys. That's Calvary Chapel Pacific Coast. And uh, that's downy people. That's downy people. Ha! <laughs> no way. We're all like that. I've done a lot of those. What do you do? How do you handle it? I'm a liar. 
<laughs> We're all liars. We all do it, little white lies, little things, little excuses. And why do we say those little things? Because it makes us look better. It gets us out of trouble. It's all pride. You're like, but Andrew, that is so ingrained in me. I don't know if I could stop. The little ones, the big ones. What do we do? Well, look what it says there in that verse, in verse 25. It says, what's the little thing it says here? Therefore, 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 look, it's looking back. You have to realize that you're a new creation in Christ. What he just talked about. You had to realize that ain't you anymore, buckaroo. That's not you. you to, therefore, it shows you back. It shows you what, what we just covered, that you have been, you have put off the old man, been renewed, put on the new. That's no longer your status anymore. You are technically not labeled a liar anymore. You're, you're a new creation in Christ. We have to grab that and know that. Then, then we do what it says, therefore, put it away, lying. Put it away. That, in the Greek, is put it away, get this, guys, once and for all. It's not just, oh, just, you know, when you get a chance, stop doing it. No. Put it away once and for all. Be done with it. That means that it comes down to this. It's a choice. It's every time we lie, there is a little, so, but so often we do it so fast, we just literally blow through it so fast. We're just like, duh, duh, duh. and we don't even know. It's just, just the lie. It is such a fast thing. It's such a quick thing. And then you realize, you look back, you're like, I just lied. It's like blowing a stop sign. And, and that's how it is. You just, it, it's such a quick thing. But yet, we choose to do it. We choose. I choose. And we have to choose not to lie and to speak truth. So put it away. And then recognize, number two, guys, recognize that it is a sin. Stop making excuses for lying. Don't call it a little white lie or, a, or a just a, oh, it just, it, it, will make, it will make things easier. Good grief, guys. Admit that it's sin and that you're a liar. That's hard to do because it's the first blow to pride when you admit it. And then, okay, you admit it. Now what are you going to do? Then confess it. Get to the cross. Confess it. You know, God's grace and forgiveness is there for every single lie that you have told in your life. All the lies that you're telling now and all the lies that you're ever going to tell, get this, guys, and all the, the present and the future and the past failures, every bit of sin, God's grace will forgive. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So don't think that, oh, God will never forgive me. Oh, yes, he will. He will forgive you just as quick as you lie. God will be just as quick to forgive. That's just how it is. And you've got to confess it. Confess the pride. Dig up the roots. Don't just confess the, the, the sin of lying. Confess the pride part. Because when you start to humble yourself in the eyes of God, in confession and repentance, and we humble ourselves before God, guess what happens? Then he starts, then the pride isn't there anymore. And if the pride isn't there, the lying won't be there either. How great is that? Number four, commit your mouth to God. It's God's mouth. It's God's lips, his tongue. You know, we look at the book of James and it says that the tongue is like, it, it's, it needs to be bridled. It's a spark that starts a fire. Uh, it just, uh, it's horrible. The mouth is. Isaiah, when he came before God and was being called by God, he sees God in all of his glory. And in the glory of God, he sees his own perfect imperfections. And the thing that stuck out the most for him in his imperfections that he had was this one single thing. My lips, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he, when he confesses that in the presence of God, guess what occurs? It says that an angel goes forth to the altar, pulls out a coal, and puts it upon his lips, and he 
sanctifies, he purges his lips. And those lips now belong to God. And you got to say, Lord, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords, the air in my lungs, they're all yours. Anything that causes me to talk, it's yours, Lord. And I'm just going to give that over to you. Commit your mouth to God. It's God's mouth now. And then, number five, put on the new man, the new woman. That's a heart change. Remember, out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus says, the mouth speaks. And so the mouth talks because the heart's bad. And so, but yet when Jesus comes in and changes our heart, and we put on and die to self, we put on the new man, get this, because of our Lord, the Trinity, the Godhead, is truth, the word is truth as well. We'll walk in the light. You know, look at, look at verse 25. He quotes, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. He quotes right there in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16. He quotes the word. To put on the new man, guys, we've got to be in the word. We have to be in the word. We've got to be in the word. It's all about the word and putting on the new man. In order to speak the truth, we've got to be around the truth. We've got to be soaked, marinated in the truth. You know what marination does to a piece of meat. You know, that's a good thing to do sometimes. Even you marinate a carne asada overnight. Oh, just some good things that happen. It takes on the flavor. It takes on the character. It softens it up. It makes it tenderized. It makes it pleasurable. And that's the thing that we need to do in our hearts, in that new man, we need to marinate ourselves in the things of God. Having to do with the love. Oh, what's my eyes watching? What's my ears hearing? What's, our, what's my hands touching and doing? What's my mind thinking? What's, what is my heart loving? And we need to marinate ourselves and be surrounded by the presence of God and abide in him. And that happens also through prayer and the word and worship and all that great stuff we always talk about. That's where it's at. And when we marinate ourselves in the things of God, lying will become less. The failures and the stumbles of lying and the, it, it will just, it, truth will blossom. It just will happen. And then lastly, number six, how do you do it? It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. We have to have the dynamic ability from the Holy Spirit, his work in us, a divine love for others. See, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you get a love for others. And when you have a love for someone, you're not going to want to lie to them. And when God puts that love in your heart to, for others, for the Lord, you're not going to want to hurt him. You're going to want to love him. You're going to want to please him. You're going to also want to love others. And how can you lie to someone like that? You can't. Divine love placed in your heart, energized by the Spirit. If you love them, you're not going to lie to them. You're going to be honest. Why should I not lie? In? Why should I not? Why should I only speak truth only? He gives a reason here. It's interesting in these passages, these bullet points that we're going to be covering in the next two weeks. When he goes through these things, he says something very cool. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. He quotes the passage right there. And he says the reason, for we are members of one another. We're part of the body of Christ. How true is that? We're part of the body of Christ. That's his reason why we shouldn't lie. We're part of the body. So we shouldn't lie to other Christians because they're part of the body of Christ. You know, how horrible would the, the natural body that we have be if the body lied to each other you know what if i put my hand on a stove and it's burning and the hand is saying it's burning and the brain the, the arm muscle is saying no it's not you're fine everything's fine and i'm not going to move your hand off that plate just sizzle buddy sizzle no that'd be horrible that would be horrible and the body fights and it, it, it has to be honest with each other when you stub your toe, you're very honest about that. Your body reacts. Pain. And yet, guys, the body of Christ as the church needs not to lie. We're all, get this, we're members of one another. 
we're members of one another. And if we are members of one another, then guess what? We have to love one another. And then also what it says in the last verse, in verse 32, we have to be kind to one another. It's a one another statement. So we're the body of Christ, so we shouldn't lie to one another. And because we're members of each other, because we're members of one another, and because we're the body of Christ, and this is really good, it's really neat, we shouldn't lie to each other, of course, but we shouldn't lie to the world as well. Because if we lie to the world, guess what occurs? We do something horrible. We misrepresent our truthful God, the truthful head of the church, Jesus Christ. And so if we lie, if you go to your work, your school, your, and we become liars as known Christians, guess what? People will look at us and go, oh. And because we're the body of Christ, because we're members of one another, we represent the head, which is Jesus Christ. And if we are liars, guess what? It's not going it, it, to look good. It's not going to make God look good. People see us. And so we, when we bust in and we're lying about something or lying about that, guess what? It just ruins the reputation of Jesus. And that's sad. And so that's why we don't lie. The body doesn't deserve it. The world doesn't deserve it. And it ruins our witness of the church and of Jesus. So we're told supposed to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, loving one another. And you know what? This is what it comes down to with with not lying and telling the truth in all things. Listen up. It's just pleasing to God. He just loves it. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I literally want to please the Lord. As much as I can, as much as I possibly can, pleasing, honor, and glorifying God. That's what it comes down to. And I hope and pray that you guys will do the same thing. I just want to please the Lord. I know that if I tell the truth and not lie, it's going to put a smile on my father's face. It's going to please the heart of Jesus. It's going to, it's going to just make the spirit be really stoked if I just don't lie and I tell the truth. Now, some people will say, well, if I lie, Pastor Andrew, it will help the person. I understand those things where you're like, you know, if I tell the truth, it's not going to be... But you know what? Let's just pursue truthfulness. It's not an easy thing to do. Everything fights against it. Satan wants you to be a liar because it means that he owns you. The flesh wants you to lie because it's trying to protect your prideful heart, our, our prideful heart. And then the world wants you to lie because, you know, they don't want to be alone in their lives. And so everybody's pressuring you to lie. And then there's Jesus and says, you, you want to you please me today? You want to please me? And that's where it comes down to. You're like, I don't know if I'm capable of it. Pastor Andrew, I'm a liar. I've, I'm looking at my life and I've, I've lied so much, I can't even think straight. And you know, that's the thing about lying. It just confuses everything. You got to keep them in order. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the worst part of lying? You got to remember your lies. You tell one lie to some per person and they tell another lie to somebody else. And you got to keep that balance, man. I had one guy who, he, he came to know the Lord. He goes, I had so many lies in my life, Andrew, that I had to write them down in a notebook. Because I wanted to make sure that I was telling my mom one lie, my father another lie. I was telling my friend another lie. I was telling my wife another lie. I was telling my boss another lie. And I had to make sure. So I wrote them all down. And so he was living literally a lie. This fake self, this fake him, this avatar of who he really was. Why? Because of pride. God wants us to please him, to be just different than the world. You're like, Pastor Andrew, I'm in too deep. <laughs> I got too many lies swirling around. Oh, God's grace can just... That's not a challenge for him. God's love is not a challenge for, it, it just, it don't even worry. The moment you're like, well, what if I got to you know, okay, I'm good with confessing my sins to the Lord and laying it all out and being honest with him. I'm a liar, Lord. But I don't want anybody else to know about all the lies I told him in the past. 
Watch what the Lord does. One of the greatest pieces of advice I've ever heard anybody give was she was talking to some guy, and I was, I shouldn't have done, I was over listening, you know, listening in. And she was confessing. She says, I'm a liar about this, that, and the other. And the guy says, why don't you go and every person that you remember telling a lie to, go back and tell the truth. Now, that petrifies me. <laughs> that scares me to death. But when that happened, there was a revival occurring at the school when that happened. And she went and did it. She came back a couple weeks later, I heard, and, and, and the guy testified. She came back and she goes, I'm so free. I'm so free. It's just freedom. And, and, and he goes, what do you mean? And she goes, and that's the thing about lying. It, it, it changes you up. It's bondage. That's why Jesus says that the truth shall set you free. That's why he says it that way. And that's the neat thing, guys. So just be led by the spirits. He'll empower you to be an honest person, free from lies, pleasing God, telling the truth. Because you know what? We have the most truthful message in the world. Amen? Amen. That there's a God that sent his son to die for us. He rose again, ascended to the Father, and it's only through him that we might be saved. The greatest truth of all. Let's not, and this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to ruin that. So let's be honest. Let's not lie. You know, also in our honesty, truth is, is with love. I've met some people that when they are truthful with you, Truth is, comes in a form of a Louisville Slugger baseball bat. <laughs> hey, let me tell you some truth. Let me tell you about yourself. Let me tell you about you. And they're just not gentle. Be loving. If you speak truth, make sure that you're covered in love. No one wants that. Because then, you, then, then what happens? You become pharisaical. You, you become a... You, no one wants that. No one wants, and you know what? You're a jerk if you think that. <laughs> Don't do that. Be loving. Be filled with the Spirit, and watch what the Lord does. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for these words, these beautiful things from your scriptures, Lord. And Father, I pray with every person here, Lord, Lord, just check our heart as a church, Lord. Everybody here individually, one on one before you, Lord, I pray that you, Lord, would help us to be honest. If there's anyone in this place, Lord, that is dealing with lying, struggling with it, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, convict hearts, bring us to the cross, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for our sins. Wash us and cleanse us. Lord, help us lie no more. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, and give us the power to be honest, to speak the truth. Lord, let us have the power to go and fix it. And Lord, you go ahead of us and fix it. We pray that we wouldn't lie about ourselves or about situations. We wouldn't we wouldn't mess around with pride. But Lord, that we would just seek you. You are the truth. Fill us with the spirit of truth so that we can please the father of all truth. We love you, Lord. And we praise you in your holy name. Thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, guys. It's my prayer this week that you go out with just filled with the spirit. And if you got convicted today, good. But guys, remember, conviction is not condemnation. It's not to make you feel or waller in your, oh, I'm such a bad person. Then confess it. Get washed in the blood of the Lamb. Get forgiven. And watch what he does. And this week, let's practice honesty. Let's practice putting off lying. And just, just do it. All right, guys?
and he'll give you the ability to do it. Amen? I love you. Jesus Christ loves you, and he's coming soon. Praise the Lord. You got a song for us, Tyler? Go for it.